Hi, welcome to Fiber Chats. My name is Irene. I'm the host here. And today my guest is Heidi Parks, who is the quilter. Hi, Heidi. Hi, thanks for having me. Thank you. So I met you through another person. I recently interviewed Zach Foster, and I absolutely love talking to Zach because he has like this very interesting opinions on everything and very unique approach to quilting. It's like there, it was very philosophical discussion. So it's like, I really love chatting with him. What makes you best of friends? Oh my goodness. Um, we met, I think in 2015 on Instagram and he did an interview on a different podcast and told me I should listen to it because he mentioned me. And that's when I realized he was a high school art teacher, a high school Spanish teacher. And having teaching in common in addition to quilting felt like just such a big thing to have in common. I also love the improvisational style that he has in his quilts, the just thoughtfulness that he brings to being a friend. He mails me lots of handmade gifts and we, uh, you just have a really gentle, thoughtful rapport with each other. We, we keep each other front of mind. Right. When did you start quilting? I began quilting in 2013 uh, in terms of quilting with fabric. <laughs> I had a quilt top that my grandmother had purchased at an estate sale that was hand pieced, waiting to be quilted. And my mom was decluttering for her and decided to give that to me. And that sparked me to do some quilting. But I already considered myself a fiber artist. At the time, I was a high school art teacher. And I had studied fiber art at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. So I took a quilting class there probably in 2004. But we never, I never quilted with fabric. In the class, I was quilting with paper and doing patchworks, sewing book pages together. Uh, so I was kind of quilting, but not quite. I also, in probably junior high, got one of those Hearth Song brand DIY crafting kits of making a quilt. So I tried some fabric patchwork there, but there was some raw edge applique that got me very confused. And I, it was one of the few kits like that, that I never finished. So technically perhaps um, the mid nineties is the first time I quilted. Right. Well, when you first started quilting, was it more traditional looking quilt? So did you go into like the very modern sort of surrealistic approach that you have now to quilts? Mm. I began, I wanted the quilt top from my grandmother was a log cabin style top. And I decided that I didn't have a big piece of fabric for the back of the quilt. So I pieced another quilt top to go on the opposite side. And I was looking at a very specific G's bend quilt that I wanted to try to replicate because I thought it was beautiful, but I didn't know anything about curves. So I was just snipping and ripping the fabric to, to cut it to be right. So of course everything was perfect right angles. And I made the most square rectangular improvisational G's bend inspired quilt that I think I've ever seen. So it was, it was an attempt at um, something improvisational, but it was actually very geometric and, uh, you know, not, not the kind of imagery or abstraction that I think I'm known for now. One of the things though, that did feel very much like me, and I previously had been doing a lot of embroidery. In fact, this embroidery that I have over my shoulder is the type of hand embroidery that I was doing at the time. And I made a hand embroidered label for that quilt. I added lots of little moments of minutia. Like I included my address, but not the city and the state. I included that I was inspired by G's Bend, that I had watched the TV series Fringe while I was doing the quilting. And that I think is the part that felt the most like me when I decided to do the label with the embroidery. 
Right. So now you, you are an instructor now, you're teaching people how to quilt. When you were learning how to quilt, what was your, what, where, what sources did you use for your own education? Number one, I would say I used my friend Kat Gelder um, and her mother. Her mother, Diane Gelder, did all kinds of crochet and knitting and quilting and every and basket weaving. And Kat was my friend from junior high. So we'd known each other for ages. And she, I included writing about her in that same quilt label as well. So as I was deciding what to do for my quilt, I'd ask Kat, like, how, how do you attach the quilt together? And she said, well, most people baste it with safety pins. I was like, okay, I'll do that. And she would, I would ask her, is it allowed to do two quilt tops? And why not? Sure you can. <laughs> so really just generous answers that allowed me to do whatever I wanted and a, a few of the basics. I early on, as I was continuing to make more quilts and get more curious about them, I watched PBS, Why Quilts Matter. I watched um, a documentary about G's Bend and I scoured the books, the two books that existed about those at the time. And, uh, you know, I, I remember vividly the first time I wanted to do a curve in 2014. I called Kat up on the phone and I, what do you do? <laughs> you just match them. <laughs> and so I did it. And, you know, she kind of got me through that stress, but I would say it was a lot of trial and error and just checking in with someone who, you know, by no means did Kat feel like an expert quilter. I think she'd made two quilts at the time, <laughs> but it was just enough to give me the confidence to try things out. And I, had enough previous experience with sewing clothes and other textile things that that quilting just made sense to me in in a way that maybe some other art forms or other certainly things that aren't art related right. um, don't make sense immediately. So uh, when a student comes to you now and ask you, is that allowed? Is that something I could do in quilting? Do you ever say no? <laughs> no I don't think that would be very me. Um, you know, the, the things that I would say aren't allowed are imposing your rules on someone else, uh, that, that kind of thing. I wouldn't, um, although here, here's the thing that I do get very rule bound by is you're not allowed to hurt your body when you're making a quilt. So if people are doing things that are dangerous with the rotary cutter or they are quilting and not using a thimble, I will try to remind them of why that can cause problems to their body over time. When I was starting, I didn't have a teacher and, and I, you know, my friend Kat only machine quilted. She hadn't hand quilted, so she didn't know anything about thimbles. And I was using a metal thimble and that was pressing on my finger in the wrong way. And in, I would say 2017, I realized kind of suddenly that I had some nerve damage. And if I would be emptying the dishwasher or doing things in the house, there was this really wrong way that I could hit my thimble finger and it would send shooting pain all the way down my arm. And I thought, wow, I have to, find a new thimble, number one. And then I eventually had to pester my doctor and then ultimately find an occupational therapy therapist. And I did a lot of work to heal my hand to the point that now I'm, I'm better there, but that's the type of thing that, that I would really try to provide instruction and some pretty hard yeses and nos for students. Right. But in terms of the aesthetics of a quilt, I would not tell them no. Also a yoga teacher, right? So mm -hmm. you, I saw on your YouTube channel, and by the way, guys, if you haven't subscribed yet to <laughs> Heidi's YouTube channel, now would be a great time to look at it. Um, so you met, you did some exercises for the hands, and this is something like the most common complaint among not only quilters, but like knitters and crocheters and like all the craft people who do crafts with you know their hands so how did you start developing those exercises specifically for crafters 
I first got excited about yoga in 2008 because as a high school teacher, it was a very stressful job and my third year teaching was a hard time for me. So I began yoga for my mind, not for my body. And then I was pretty delighted to realize that I liked the changes I was experiencing in my body and kind of feeling like, oh, wow, I didn't realize I was occasionally stiff or in pain or feeling things I didn't want to feel. Um, so having arrived that route, I was initially really drawn to my teacher, Indu Aurora, and she taught yoga classes that felt different from a lot of the other ones that were available at the time when I was living in the suburbs of Illinois in Naperville. And Indu would teach classes on yoga therapy and a lot of different meditation classes. Ultimately, I had so much benefit from learning from her and some other teachers that I decided to become a yoga instructor. I studied with Rolf Gates and learned vinyasa flow yoga. And that was number one reason why I did that was so that I could become a high school yoga club sponsor so I could help my students with yoga. The Then Indu told me that she was leading a yoga teacher training on yoga therapy because she didn't teach entry-level yoga training. So I couldn't learn with her initially. The yoga therapy that I learned with her when I was in the teacher training program compared to when I was a regular student learning from her was such an incredible depth and way of thinking about the body. She included a lot about Ayurveda and breathing and mudra hand gestures and had a very holistic way of looking at your body. It was not at all exercise. She likes to call it a work in rather than a work out. So from her, I learned a lot about movements you could do with your hands, really creative ways to sync movement and breath to turn something into a meditation or to make it bigger than what it seemed. When I was in my occupational therapy then around 2017, I would get homework you know, to lay my hands flat on a table and move them in and out or to put my hands straight and lift up and down or to have my hands heavy at my side and open and close them. And by themselves, they, they felt a little hollow to me. And I was able to use those skills that I learned from Indu to sync my breathing as I moved in and out or to create a really beautiful, smooth flow. One of my favorite flows that I've made is with palms to palm at my heart. And it begins with opening my fingers closed. So it's palm to palm instead of palms at the tabletop. And then it flows into flexing side to side, moving forward and back, expanding and closing. And then the opposite way, stretching your fingers uh, as well as twisting side to side. So there's a real beautiful arc that I made with those six movements compared to that kind of static medicinal feeling of those movements when they were by themselves with the occupational therapist. Um, so for me, it was blending those, those different resources to be able to develop a lot of them. When you approach quilt, like, do you approach it also, like, do you, is there a story to every quilt you create? Is it also like a spiritual experience to create the quilt? Hmm. That's a wonderful question. I, I think at a certain level, there is a story to every quilt. I, one of my favorite artists since I was in art school at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago is Mark Bradford. And I was blown away at the time about how he was making meaning with his materials and going in the streets of LA and finding advertisements on the street and then taking them back to the studio and collaging them onto bed sheets and calling them paintings when they're this textile paper string hybrid. And, and so for me, even if it's a quilt that doesn't have a ton of meaning initially, there is meaning from the materials of, of what I'm juxtaposing together. Is it a tablecloth and quilt and cotton? Is there some kind of vintage element that I'm bringing in? But then 
there are other quilts that for me are incredibly meaningful. Some of the quilts that I've been making recently are more like a diary quilt. There's one that I made when I was in an art servancy artist residency here in Milwaukee, where I spent a year connecting with the Lake Park Park here along Lake Michigan. That quilt, still hard for me to remember the title. It's Reconstruction, Reconstructed something, Steps, Wax. And, <laughs> um, and that quilt, for me was tracking the moon during the month when I began the quilt. It used the courthouse steps pattern as one little piece of applique and that referenced um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg passing away and the transition in the courts. It also connected to, you know, again, to some of those areas of minutia, like little things that maybe don't matter, but feel really good to observe. So. I, it was fall and I picked up a couple leaves that had fallen on the ground and I pressed them. And while they were in my book being pressed, I like was really excited. So from memory, I did an embroidery of the leaves and then I did an applique of the leaves. And then I got them out from being pressed and I realized my memory had distorted them a lot. That's the the reason why I used that word reconstruction, reconstructed, because it's something that we do with our memories of re, reconstructing memories of changing things depending on um, the parts that stood out in our memory. So once I got the leaves out from being pressed, I did a really accurate tracing of the leaf and put that on the quilt top as well. And for me, it was a beautiful meditation on my ability to remember what had happened as I was trying to make this diary quilt to keep track of um, fall 2020. Like if I can't remember the leaf that was in my hand 24 hours ago, like how am I doing it remembering the other things that are happening right now, especially with the pandemic, it was this moment where things that had happened two weeks ago felt like a year ago. And then the things that happened yesterday felt like, um, you know, just it, it was very hard to keep track of time in general. I also put things on the quilt that were simply convenient. There's an area in the bottom right corner of the quilt where I just had a lot of like unfinished threads because I had previously been making a quilt with a lot of thread colors in it. So each I had this big stack of maybe 20 needles that all still had thread on them. And I was at my aunt's house, we had a pizza night tradition. We were in a bubble together and I just brought all those needles and I thought I'll just doodle and embroider and use up all that thread in the bottom corner. And then however it turns out, it turns out, but we're gonna eat pizza, watch a movie, drink some wine and <laughs> I'm gonna use up this thread. And, and, and that for me, I think is maybe one of the most spiritual parts of the quilting process for me is finding the space where the quilting can work with my life instead of against it, where I, I can find time to make a quilt and I can just trust that maybe what feels good for me to do today is the thing that will be the most meaningful and beautiful and interesting on the quilt. There's this really practical aspect of it for me. And I think, um, you know, at the time I was also working with a creative career coach, her name's Kate Shuda, and she was sharing with me a lot about how I had <laughs> these real struggles with time management and how, you know, how am I going to find time to do all the things that I want to do? And I also this and also that. And, and she said to me, well, how do you do it when you're quilting? <laughs> and I felt like so embarrassed right away because I thought, I'm telling my students all the time, no matter what, you have time to quilt. You can pack your quilt in a little go bag and you can quilt at the, you know, anywhere. You could quilt on the bus, in the car, you could quilt at your friend's house, you could quilt in the waiting room at the doctor's office, the sky's the limit. And, 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 and other parts of my life, I wasn't able to have that same practice. I had all these boundaries about when I could and couldn't achieve things. So uh, it's kind of putting what I've learned into the quilt and then taking what I've learned from the quilting and putting it 
into my daily practice, I think is, is one of the parts that feels really meaningful. Right. Well, I've heard you mentioning that you like, um, like you're very conscious about the material that you use and how you like have the whole jar of little leftover bits and pieces and then you use them. Right. <laughs> so how is um, like you collect it in this jar? How do you decide like where you're gonna use them? Do they spark your imagination just by colors? Like, how do you use that jar? Is that like your inspiration jar? Hmm. So a jar like this, I might use as stuffing for Trapunto to put a 3D aspect in a quilt. I also, this quilt that's over my shoulder is the, the first one I believe where I used yarn. So there's underneath this, scrim of silk organza there are a lot of threads and it's pretty random like I would just pull out a clump and then you know, I've got this big thick red ribbon in there maybe I would say ah, that's not quite right for this moment so I might pick at it a little bit but I really like the element of chance that would happen in terms of which colors are highlighted or how things would lay out when I was initially deciding to go that far that I was going to keep my little tails and every little scrap, that is something that I got the idea to do from my friend, Zach Foster. He had posted a photo of his ball jar that he was using to catch even the little ends. And I immediately thought, oh, how have I been throwing those away for years? <laughs> uh, and so I stored them up, not knowing what I would do with them, but knowing that I liked the idea of not throwing them away. That maybe again, that microcosm of in my quilting practice could be a small safe space to try zero waste or to try some things that maybe I also wanted to experiment with in the kitchen or other places in life. And this particular quilt I was making while I was doing a lot of dating. I had been single for a while and I was gonna continue to be single for at least another year um and I had gone on uh like two dates with this guy who I thought was really great and apparently he didn't want to go out with me again but he did want to do this thing that they call breadcrumbing in the dating world where he wanted to text me once in a while just to get the thrill that I was still interested but he didn't want to make plans and didn't want to go out and certainly didn't want um, anything connected to a relationship and I was trying to um, get a lot of advice on YouTube. So I watched so many online dating tips from Matthew Hussey, who's a big YouTuber. Um, and one of his bits of advice that was sticking with me at the time was the idea that of all the things that are on my wish list that I want to find in a partner, the number one thing that I want is that that person likes me and wants to spend time with me. The rest doesn't matter. And so I was having this kind of cognitive dissonance moment, but I like so much about him, but he doesn't like me. And I found myself going back through our messages on the online dating app that we'd been using and looking back at them like, what did he mean when he texted that? Because I was reading it with the rose colored glasses of like, maybe this could be something. <laughs> and, and, and it gave me the feeling when I was able to step back a little bit, look at it, think about it and, and, and ponder the way that I do when I'm making a quilt. And I thought, uh, you know, these text messages are like, like little bits of evidence from a crime scene. And I realized, like this jar that I've been accumulating for the last year and a half is also like little bits of evidence from a crime scene. And I can look in here and know, oh, that's, that's the yarn from this thing. And then that's the fabric scrap from when I made circles. And this is from, you know, the winter 36 times is a quilt that I had recently made that I had a lot of identifiable scraps from. And and so that's what sparked me to put those scraps in the quilt initially. And I find one of the approaches to making that I love is when I can think about things as a verb rather than as a representative drawing. Certainly, you know, this love scene of 
a man eating grapes <laughs> from a woman's hand. Uh, you know, very representational love scene. But things that are more like a verb, like how does it, how does it feel to look back through my text messages and hunt for those scraps? And then how does it feel to look back through here and hunt for things? Um, you know, an another example of that kind of verbness is when I'm making an internal corner, like an L-shaped corner with applique, it's particularly fragile at the inside of that corner. And rather than putting glue invisibly or using fusible stuff or doing all these secret things, I like to just put a couple extra whip stitches there. That way the viewer can see that that area needed extra support. I'm not hiding a need for support. And to, to me, it, it, it's that, that little bit of being like a verb of explaining or, or showing by doing rather than by telling. Uh, and so for me, there are lots of moments when I'm working with those materials that it pushes it into that verb land that really excites me. And I think it also connects to the idea that I had around time with that bottom right corner in the, the quilt that I was describing where I can find time if I'm quilting where there's a will, there's a way. And when I'm sewing as well, it's relatively easy for me to make the most out of my supplies. Uh, right now I'm making a third quilt that's made all of white fabric scraps because I wanted to find a way to edit through all of the larger pieces of scraps that I have. And, and so using a monochromatic color palette was really helpful for me. And with that process, I'm <clears throat> you know, giving myself the challenge of how many white scraps do I actually have? Yeah. <laughs> I'm realizing I need to make a fourth quilt in that series because I still have more of them. And, and, and that is just, it's pushing me in such an interesting way to deal with what I already have. Uh, I think it's a microcosm as well for right now, I'm trying to clean up my, um, one of my workspaces has gotten really wild and messy. And so I'm trying to see how can I be more of a minimalist there? How can I uh, tame some things in my kitchen as well? And so just like taming excess, both in my quilts and in my life feels uh, really helpful to explore right now. Right. Well, when I was talking to Zach and I asked him like, what was the craziest material he ever used? He showed me that quilt that he recently finished with uh, swimming trunks that somebody mm. sent him a whole box of like old swimming trunks and he made, it wasn't his favorite just because it's polyester and it's like slippery and it was hard to work with, but that was his. What's the craziest things you worked with? I would say the craziest quilt I ever made was um, my first ever finished quilt that I made in my metalworking class in college <laughs> before I took the fiber art quilting class. Uh, the assignment, yeah, I, my first creative love was pottery. So like right over here is a vase that I made back when I was in high school and I was taking ceramics classes and thrilled to have access to the enormous kiln instead of just the small one that I had at home. And I thought, what else would be like a really badass class to take in, um, you know, in art school? And I thought, metalworking, I can use the blowtorch and fire, <laughs> and, like, all these things I can't do in my living room. Um, and our, our first assignment had to do with cold connections, so no blowtorch allowed. And I had this copper sheet metal that I would lay textiles on top of and run through a press so it would get the physical impression of the lace or the fabric on it. And then I used a hole punch and I punched holes in all those pieces of copper and I cut them into, it, it was one of those quilts where I wanted to do everything in one quilt. So part of it's a nine patch, part of it's tumbling blocks, part of it's flying geese. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I cut those shapes out and then the metal was really hard to work with. So I thought, let me add in 
an old beach towel, some photographs, some book pages. Um, it had a variety of fabrics and papers mixed in. And then I sewed the entire thing together with wire, which again was not pleasant on my fingers. It's the first <laughs> and last metal quilt that I ever made. Uh, but yeah, hand piecing a quilt with wire is by far the strangest quilt that I've ever made. And that was um, you know, probably 2002 when I was making that one. Why did you decide to start a YouTube channel? Like, why did you need another venue to show your stuff? That was my 2021 New Year's resolution. I decided I was going to be a YouTuber. Um, I, I had been teaching yoga in person here in Milwaukee since pretty much since I moved here in 2015. And at the time I was teaching two classes, sorry, two classes a night, three nights a week. So six yoga classes a week. And then when the pandemic came along, that paused and I realized, wow, I was actually checking my clock all day long so that at 5.30 PM, I could walk over you walk two blocks to go teach yoga and then come back home. And that there was kind of this internal stress on me of like always trying to make sure I got to teach yoga on time and teaching things because it was what the class was compared to like what my body actually wanted in terms of a yoga practice, because generally I was teaching beginners. So I wasn't able to do as many fancy, exciting things as I wanted, for example. Um, so that slowing down that happened in 2020, I realized felt really good for me in the area of yoga. And then as things were opening up, I could go back to teach in person with a mask if I wanted. They also suggested to me that I could teach on Zoom if I wanted. And I thought, if I'm going to teach yoga on Zoom, I might as well teach it myself Right. I was already teaching quilting classes on Zoom and really loving that forum. So, um, so I was thinking, should I commit to like every Tuesday at 5 p.m., teach yoga on Zoom, have people sign up? And then I thought, I don't want to collect money that way. And I don't want, and, and so I ultimately felt like I would rather with my yoga because that's the one thing that I do push back against students in class where you should care more about your body. You should do things that help balance things out. Um, that I thought it felt like a really good balance in my career of getting paid to teach quilting, but then feeling generous with yoga and being able to give that back to, to, you know, to the broader community. And, you know, it's been amazing. I just recently had someone who specializes with piano playing. And she found the hand yoga that I do on YouTube and showed some of my YouTube videos at a conference. And then she was so generous. She sent me a payment from PayPal. And I was like, that's, it's for free. <laughs> um, but I, I felt like, you know, when you are generous energetically, there are a lot of other things that come back that feel so good. And the, on Instagram, you can't really archive tutorials in the useful way that you can on YouTube. You can't search through the history of my posts. Like no one knows that five, five years ago, I gave a helpful tip about this or that on there. So I liked the way that you that on YouTube, I could make playlists, I could catalog things, I could title them in a way that could be searched. And I loved that maybe I could be getting eventually financially compensated for my work, even though I was giving it away for free. Like that, that just appealed to me so deeply. And, and now it's just the beginning of 2022 and it, it feels amazing to have been able to like, create that goal of getting paid on YouTube and sharing things um, and, and, and like striking a balance. What's your favorite moment when the new video is being posted? Let's say a day goes by, like what's in that first 24 hours? What makes your day? I love when I get a good comment, when someone says this has meant something to me or I've been practicing 
hand yoga with you for a month or a year or two weeks, and I feel a difference. Uh, I've had students, um, yeah, I, I feel like I'm especially excited about working with the elderly with hand yoga. And I've had students who are just kind of starting to notice like they're struggling to do the buttons on their blouse because of arthritis or, or congestion. And when they write to me and say, you know, after just a month or after just two months, like I can do the buttons on my blouse more easily again, like that kind of really practical everyday stuff. It's cool to be able to make art and do this fancy thing and have hand yoga help me the way that it does. But when it helps someone with something so practical and when they thought that deterioration of their hands was inevitable, that they were, that that's just part of getting old. And then they share with me that they were able to turn something around or feel a real change that um, it just, it makes me so happy. That's, that's the moment that I really love. Is there anything you dislike about being a YouTuber? <laughs> I just like making the thumbnail photos. <laughs> it just, it like it slows me down so much between making the video, uploading it, and then pressing like publish instead of unlisted. I have I have a couple YouTube videos right now that already and all they need is a cute thumbnail photo. So um, that, that I, and, and that's my answer with quilting too. When people ask me, what's your least favorite part of quilting? It's like taking a photo of the quilt and <laughs> editing it on Photoshop. <laughs> but there, it's important. Otherwise you don't communicate things and spread the word. So I, I realize why it's important. I want to get, more frictionless with my photography and thumbnail situation but currently that is definitely the hardest part for me what about instagram like what's the best and the worst of instagram for you mm. instagram's one of those places that i just really loved from the start and i i feel like i'm good at instagram because i like instagram and I think people who struggle with Instagram, like my first question is like, but do you enjoy being on there? Okay. Um, I, when I was a teacher, I, you know, I only had my Facebook friends were my followers on Instagram back in like 2014. And I, I, my last year teaching high school was a hard year. I, they had me spread way thinner than I used to be. I was teaching at two high schools instead of one high school. And I looked to Instagram to be like, let me try to find the best part of my day and take a picture of it and, and post it. And if it's you know, the way I wrote something on my to-do list or looking at the materials in the art classroom or like the clouds in the sky, let me find something pretty or uplifting and share that. And I feel like that's still largely my experience both scrolling through my unique feed of the people that I follow and the things that I post like this is the most exciting thing that's going on for me right now today or the most beautiful thing or you know the, the way I got something to work visually so I love that aspect of sharing and seeing and the community aspect around comments and insights. I recently made my first ever hand tied quilt with yarn and it's much more physically demanding to pull yarn through a quilt than to pull thread that I'm used to. So I had to, to do a lot of problem solving to figure out a different needle, a different pulling tool. And I was able to make some posts on Instagram to say like, hey, community, what do you guys do? How do you solve this problem? Because um, I'm excited about this quilt, but it's not worth hurting my body. And the, the flood of information that I got with wonderful tips around different tools and different needles just like blew me away. And I find so much, um, you just shared respect on that space that there are so many people offering really helpful insights um, that are you know just as helpful as what I'm hopefully sh giving back on that platform. 
the other half of your question was, what do I not like about Instagram? And that is a tough question. There's part of me that misses the chronological days where things just kind of made sense of what I see. I would say it's, um, yeah, I, I, on purpose, I'm following over a thousand people because I really, you know, whenever I saw them, I was excited by what they did. And I feel like sometimes the algorithm lets me see 100 of those people real frequently and the other 900 plus, never do they ever show up. And I wish that I got to experience a more diverse look at the people that I've chosen to follow. Um, that would be complaint number one. <laughs> Why did you decide to go with the hand quilting versus machine quilting? Like why, what's about hand quilting attract you? When I first started, I was machine piecing and hand quilting. I think I, I had done machine piecing things before. So it was intuitive and it made sense to me to piece a quilt with a machine and felt fast. And the quilt that I was making was over five feet square. It, so it just was so big. I think I couldn't fathom how I would put that through the sewing machine. And I think because the log cabin that I started with was hand pieced, it, it felt like not respectful enough to send that through a sewing machine. So the way I started was by chance. And as I continued to make more quilts, I, I quit my job nine months after I made that first quilt. So I made it in September, 2013. By May of 2014, I quit my job as a teacher to be a quilter. And I think I'd made like eight quilts at that point, not very many. So uh, I initially just wanted to make more quilts to discover what does a Heidi Parks quilt look like? Because I didn't know. And one of the quilts that I made introduced hand piecing because I had a quilt top that I wanted to make during those little bits of negative time when I was a teacher, when I had lunchroom duty or was proctoring a test. So I'd, I made these little 10 inch squares, quilt blocks, and I would do hand applique or hand embroidery on them. And I knew I loved how handwork felt. So that was the first time I started hand piecing a quilt instead of machine piecing it. I still machine pieced it together and I went on to make quite a few more machine pieced quilts, but I would notice that my favorite part of making a quilt was the hand quilting. And when I was doing the machine piecing, like my low back would hurt and my shoulder blade would start to ache. And I felt like, oh, you know, have to be in this one room with the one sewing machine. And, and then it was with my ears. I, I love watching movies while I'm quilting. Obviously, I, I started hand quilting, watching Fringe and, and hand doing that handwork alongside. So when I was piecing a quilt with the sewing machine, I could only listen to music because whenever the machine was on, it would block out the sound. So because of my body, I realized I didn't want to do things at the sewing machine anymore. And I was feeling, at the time, I didn't know enough about hand piecing to realize that, like to give the viewer enough credit that they'd be able to tell that I hand pieced versus machine pieced. I thought it would take forever to hand piece a quilt. I was very worried about the time investment and I was worried about, um, you know, like, would I get credit for hand piecing it? Or would I just be making an extraordinarily expensive quilt that no one could understand why it costs so much more than the previous work I had been making? And I went in 2015 to Seoul in South Korea to visit my favorite roommate from college. Her name is Young Oak Kim. And she introduced me to Bojagi's and Jogakbo, the Korean patchwork technique. And that uses a whip stitch where you can visibly see the thread in the seam when things are hand pieced. And it, it took me about nine months after I got home from that trip to be able to 
make a quilt with those techniques. I think I just needed to digest that information. But once I did it, there was no turning back. I realized if I was gonna hand piece something, I could visibly hand piece it with the whip stitch, with a running stitch top stitch, by using the same thick thread that I used to hand quilt. I like using DMC pearl size eight. So you can, you can see it at a distance. Uh, I thought, wow, if I'm using those threads and if I'm using different stitches, I can hand piece it and I can see it was hand pieced. And I also realized because I wasn't tied to the sewing machine, there were all these extra bits of time that I could use to quilt uh, or to, to hand piece. I also, um, I did a big series of whole cloth quilts where I thought, I don't feel like being in a sewing machine. I don't know how to hand piece a quilt. So I'll just, I'll only do hand quilting with whole cloths. And that like, was a really helpful transition for me from machine piecing into the realm of hand piecing. So um, yeah, it's because of my body. <laughs> is selling quilts a difficult thing? Like, is it hard for you to price it? Is it hard for you to find customers for it? especially because your quilts are not traditional looking quilts, like they very contemporary looking. Um, you know, it's, 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 um, it's complicated, I guess. On here on YouTube, I've done a series of talks called Soft Bulk with Zach Foster and also with Luke Haynes and a variety of guests. And especially with Mara Grace Ambrose, we talked a lot about pricing quilts and figuring out you know, how do you do that and what's going on. And I find it's, especially in 2021, it got a lot easier to sell quilts. Um, I just sold one recently. It's called um, We've Never Met, But I've Been an Admirer. And I sold that through an art gallery that was connected with the Art Servancy residency that I did. So it was exciting to sell a quilt with a gallery in that way, but also it was a pretty new quilt. And so I, I remember the last time I saw it at the gallery saying like, good luck, I think you can do it. <laughs> you can get sold. <laughs> but then when I found out it was sold, I was like, oh, I'll never see it again. So th there's that bitter sweetness, I think, that comes along with selling a quilt, but ultimately, it's, it's a lot like sending a kid off to college. Like they can't stay home their whole life. I don't want to have a 60 year old child at home with me <laughs> who's never left the nest. And I don't have the space to store and care for every quilt that I'm gonna make. So it, it's one of those moments where I realized the healthy next step is to sell my work and to share it with others. So that I think is helpful in terms of just the practical aspects of selling and you know, do they sell? Do, do people want the work? I find, um, you know, that, that, that goes well. It's, it's really, it's a beautiful thing to be able to visit someone's home where they have my quilt on display or other art that I've made on display. Um, I think for, for, for as many people who maybe wouldn't want my quilt because it doesn't look traditional, I think there are just as many people who do want my work for just that reason. And I always think of it as like, they've got to find a good home. So I don't want just anyone. It's not about finding, um, making the sale, but kind of like finding the right match, a lot like dating actually. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, you know, like my my current partner, I remember at some point he, he asked me, what are you looking for? And I said, I'm looking for someone I like spending time with. <laughs> you know, like I wasn't looking for a boyfriend to fill that space, but I'm looking for someone who I want to be with. And I think, you know, it's the same for my quilts. I'm looking for someone who wants to spend time with them, who loves them. I also recently decided I was going to go all in on the shopping cart model on my website. For a while, I had felt very torn between the art world and the quilt world. And in the art world, which I always you know, have one foot in, 
it's most standard to not have any prices on your website. You just show your work, your pictures. Maybe you mention a gallery that you're connected with. You have a link to them. And then the other realm that's maybe more quilting or even Etsy connected is you have a shopping cart and the price is right there. And if you want to buy a quilt, you just help yourself. <laughs> and so for, for a long time, I was trying to straddle those two realms and I would have my prices on my website, but I wouldn't have a shopping cart on my website. And like, I think ultimately by having one foot in each pond, it was hurting me more than helping me. I wasn't doing the art world way. So they were like, mm. And then I wasn't doing the self-employed quilter way. So people were confused. And I think that by going all in and saying like, I'm an independent businesswoman, if I can sell something by myself, I'm going to, and I'm going to feel great about it. And I made a big effort to renovate my website and put a shop in and upload my quilts and I had a lot of smaller works that I've made around six inch quilts, 10 inch quilts. This by November, which is my goal, November, 2021, I had 26 of them uploaded and I did a November sale. Everything was 25% off and I sold 23 out of the 26 mm -hmm. small quilts. So um, clearly if I let people understand the process and how to buy my quilts, they, they're doing a much better job of getting sold. Uh, well, so. I can't wait to see what you're going to create. I love seeing your quilts. I, I love seeing your interaction with Zach also, like watching you guys live. It's really fun. Um, and thank you so much for being my guest today. I loved having you on my channel. Oh, thank you. It was such a pleasure to get to talk to you and to, to hang out with a fellow YouTuber. I'm always <laughs> just hanging out with fellow Instagrammers. And um, this is like both, a really right? special... Both. Yeah, we're, we're, we're both. both. <laughs> <laughs> it's an awesome first for me. So thank you very much. Thank you.